We now continue on with our journey through a song. <laughs> Psalm 28. Nope. We are in Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And there are four things that God does in this psalm. Number one, he saves you. He saves you. That's uh, verses four through six. The second thing he does, he smiles on you. Seven verse ten. Seven through ten. The third thing is he shows you the way. 11 through 13, and verses 1 and verses 14, he strengthens you. Let's read Psalm 27. We will go up to verse 6 first. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Uh -huh. The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing yes. I will sing praises to the Lord. My friend, God saves you from more things that you than you know. You could be driving and all of a sudden pop, tire pops. And you get stopped. What you don't know is three miles ahead there's an accident. Or you are laying there in bed trying to get sleep and all of a sudden he wakes you up and you say now why am I awake I need to go back to bed but then you wake up and come to find out you go on Facebook and people are tore up from the floor up <laughs> so here's an opportunity to love on them and bless them and encourage them the bottom line is God saves you because David was not a priest he could not go into the tabernacle, but he could still rest in the Lord and trust him as his refuge. I'm not reading. The New Testament equivalent for this is the term to abide in me. We've gone over that a few times. But let's go ahead and move to John. Chapter 15. Fifteen. This will tell you why you're perfectly safe. John 15, verse 1. <laughs> I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. 
So neither can you unless you abide in me. You remember the chart this morning that I went over regarding the progressive uh -huh. sanctification? If you abide in him, you never have to worry about anything. That includes a completely outrageous gas bill. <laughs> Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me, if you remain in fellowship, and my words abide in you by reading the Bible and getting to know the mind of Christ, Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You remember today about the relationship between Jesus and the Father? We, too, have a relationship with Jesus that is super close. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. He didn't say partial, that it would be made full. If you're in him, you'll have a joy that will irritate all the people around you. So if you want to be an irritant to people, just be filled with joy. That's it. Say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. They don't listen. God smiles upon you. You must go beyond merely seeking God's help. Oh Lord! What shall I do? Oh Lord! How about just for no reason you say, Hey, thanks. Appreciate that. How you doing up there? You okay? Can I help you in any way? It's probably the other way around now. Turn me to number six. Numbers? Numbers? Not number six, numbers. <laughs> That's in the old book, right? Yep. We must seek his face. We sang that this morning, didn't we? And I will seek your face. Six. Verse 6. Verse 22. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, Verse 24, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you, so they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel, and I then will bless them. The Lord will make his face shine on you. The smile of God is all you need to overcome the scowls of men. You know what the scowl is? This. Brown. The smile of God beats the scowls of men. <laughs> it's all good, brother. We're going to read through 13 now. Go back to Psalm 27. We stopped at verse 6. We now go from 7 to 13. 
Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me, and answer me. When thou didst say, Seek my face, my heart said to thee, Thy face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide thy face from me. Do not turn thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me. O God of my salvation, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such a breath out of violence. If it would, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God shows you the way. Satan is constantly trying to trap you through three spots. Write these down. This is really going to make the devil mad. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. Those are his three tactics that he uses every time. He's got the same game plan. You ever play Madden football? You know when you figure out that good play that you need to beat him every time? You know that long bomb that you've been throwing catch and boy, they can't go anywhere near it? <laughs> this is how you beat him. You recognize that it's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life that always get you to stumble. That's his only tactic. And we're going to look at how he used these tactics in three primary examples. 1 John 2.16. Go to it. 1 John 2.16. Devil, well, you're about to get busted out. I'm going to show you where the Bible says, and then we'll give you the two examples. First John, First John, two sixteen. Look at fifteen. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, all that the world has to offer, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. You remember David? Remember when he was up on the roof? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. And he took her because he knew he was David, the pride of life. Matthew what? It's all right, though. <clears throat> Starting in verse 1. I'm going to, I'm, we'll read the passage and then you tell me if it's lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, or the pride of life, okay? Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. Who was he led up by? Satan. By the Spirit, it sounds. That's all right. You, you've been taught he was led up by Satan, didn't you? But the Spirit led him up there. Why? So that he could show Satan. Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led up by who? Spirit. The Spirit. Into where? Wilderness. Ah, what did we learn about the wilderness today? What, wild. What word is in wilderness? Wild. wild. <laughs> to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted, which means when you fast, what does that mean you stop doing? You give up something. You give up something. In this case, eating. Yeah. I've been fasting. 
I've been fasting from starving. <laughs> After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. So he turned it into bread. Hold on. Less than flesh. And? If this peach cobbler was ugly, would I eat it? What do I use? No, your eyes. Oh. <laughs> Boy, I'm just going to take that peach right away. <laughs> this peach is good. Lost of the flesh? Lost of the eyes? And have you ever seen a skinny king? No. Not lately. Rarely. <laughs> That's the pride of life. Oh. Being fat and happy. Oh. When I was skinny, they called me happy. It was different. Now I'm fat and happy. <laughs> so, we have that. But he answered and said, It is written, man, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city, and he had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels charge concerning you, on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. What do you think that is? The pride of life. Very good. Jesus said, on the other hand, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. All three. All three. Because he showed him, didn't he? Yeah. And his fleshly desire would be to be king. And the pride of life means he could be successful. For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and beheld, angels came and began to minister to him. See? Now watch this. Turn to Genesis 3. But we've already been there. We're going to go back. We're going to see the same thing with Eve. Starting in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said, To the serpent from the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the tree of the tree uh, from the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said, You surely shall not die. <clears throat> For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, Whoa! You see? All three. All three. Do you see? He's a sucker. We know his... We know it. That's it. That's it. No doubt about it. So whenever you hear that little voice in your head that might say, why don't you go and do that? You'll get a raise. You'll go and do that. That's it. Resist it. James 4, 7. It says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Keep going. You don't want to come here. <laughs> they kept going, too. That's what they do. Oh, <laughs> 
a song back to 27. <laughs> We only want those that are hungry to come in here. <laughs> we don't want those who have a problem with lust of the eyes or lust of the flesh or pride of life. We want those that are hungry for his word and for truth. That's who we want. Aww. I mean, if people only know they could come to church in pajamas, maybe more might come. <laughs> well, if you put it on a bullet, then maybe they'll come. Verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Oh, we're in Psalm 27. It's okay, verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. God strengthens you. We need strength for the battle and strength for the journey. And God abundantly provides for both. Be sure to take time to wait on the Lord. If you run ahead of Him or lag behind, you'll be a perfect target for the enemy. If God says go, and David says, I don't want to go to war, I'm going to hang back here. Look, naked girl. I mean, that's what happened. And he fell into it. So be careful. Stay off roofs. Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40? Yep. Verse 31. I'm almost there. That's way on the other page. <laughs> Isaiah 30. 40. 40. Okay. Talking okay. about waiting again. I'm there now. Verse 31. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Wait on the Lord. That's somewhat patience. That's it. <coughs> I've been walking the streets tonight, just trying to get it right. It's hard to see with so many around. I know I don't like being stuck, stuck in the, the ground. ground. Oh, yeah. When the streets don't change, but baby, the names. I ain't got time for the pain, because I need you. Yeah, yeah, well, I need you. <laughs> patience. Patience. Just a little patience. It's a great song. <laughs> and that's what this is. Just we should have played that song. Oh, there was someone post on Facebook. I just don't understand. Go to a church, they play rock music. They said that? I heard someone, not here, but about a different church. It's like... They try to minister to all kinds. I mean, for 50 plus years they preached, You're on the highway to hell! What's the difference? I mean, just yesterday, we heard, there's a lady ashore, all that glitters is gold, and she's buying her stairway to heaven. When she gets there, she knows that the stars are all closed. See, all those, we always look at things and we label them as if they're satanic or if they're evil. And maybe they did suck the blood out of goat's heads or whatever the heck they might have done. But the fact is, God knows. And I can't tell you how many songs that have been secular that have just spoken truth to me. Right. You know, that you never would have thought. But people try and buy their stairway to heaven all the right. time. Or work for it. Right. Same thing. Psalm 28. <laughs> this psalm is broken into two sections. We changed again. No, we already, I already read Isaiah. Where have you been? <laughs> I, know, like, the, I know the Led Zeppelin got you a little confused there, Keith, but it's all good, brother. 
That's why he knew the songs. <laughs> This song is broken into two verbs. Two verbs? Verbs, yes, V-E-R-B. -E One is called requesting. Requesting. The second is rejoicing. Requesting and, and rejoicing. rejoicing. Requesting is verse one through five, where David's enemies were undermining his reputation and his work. So he turned to the Lord with two special requests that God would speak to him, and that was that God would save him. God speaks to us in answered prayer. And the second is rejoicing, <laughs> verses six through nine. God heard him and helped him. He does the same for you today as you trust him. As I've said many times, it's one thing to believe in God. It's another to believe God. You can rejoice in the Lord even when you, when you cannot rejoice in yourself or your circumstances. Trust God to be your strength, your song, and your salvation. He is the faithful shepherd who can carry both of you and your burden. Isaiah 28. If there's anything I say that you're writing down and I go too fast and you didn't get it, just stop me. Let me know, okay? To thee, O Lord, I call my rock. Do not be deaf to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to thee for help. When I lift up my hands toward thy holy sanctuary, do not drag me away with the wicked and with those who work iniquity, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Requite! Requite. Have you ever heard that word before? It means to make it an appropriate return. Appropriate return? Uh-huh, a good return. Requite them according to their work and according to their evil of their practices. Requite them according to the deeds of their hands. Repay them their recompense, because they do not, do, they do not regard the works of the Lord, nor the deeds of his hand. He will tear them down, not build them up. Blessed be the Lord. Because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart exalts. With my song I shall thank him. The Lord is their strength, and he is a saving defense to his anointed. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. By their shepherd also, and carry them forever. These two psalms also speak to our teaching this morning. You remember what this morning was all about? Don't go looking at your notes. I want you to access this. The, we know it was the Holy Spirit, right? Uh -huh. And we know it wasn't positional sanctification. <laughs> we know that. It was the experiential sanctification. Yeah. I want you to do me a favor. Can I can I put you on the spot? Is it okay? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Would you mind? No. Do you have enough confidence that you paid close enough attention today? I hope so. Good. Come up here for a second. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> now she's playing with you, see? Can you try to explain what you learned this morning about <laughs> sanctification and experiential sanctification? What it meant to you? Let's see. For one thing, when you're starting, like, when you get saved, okay, and then you, uh, uh, you're on your road. 
Mm -hmm. You're growing. And say you get tripped up and you give up. You don't fall and go lower. You just level out until you pick back up and start going back up again. And you just on the road, you're going to keep going until you make it to heaven. <laughs> and what does she get for that? Oh, no. She gets two stars. <laughs> one for answering the question and two for coming up here. You will. And, and what we'll do is, that's why I try and have you stick them somewhere where you can look back so that when we do get the board put up, we can just, if it sticks to it, we'll just give you new ones. Okay. My dear, you get a green for go for absolutely answering that question you know fabulously. And you get a gold one for your willingness to get up there to do it. There's a lot of things you don't She did good. Yeah, we got to go up there. You got to go up front. I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. And all you got to do is give me the answer. Oh, no. Okay? Don't throw a rock at me. The Lord is your shepherd. I shall not want. There you go. Good job. You did it. You did it. Right. There is a passage in Scripture that talks about <laughs> temptation. And there's a promise that God makes that he will never allow something to happen. He will not test me above my measure. Correct. That's right. Why? <laughs> because he just won't. Why? Because it would break you. Right? Yeah. You couldn't handle it. Right. There is three types of sanctification. Uh, uh, no the final one which we haven't covered yet. <laughs> ultimate. 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 Okay, ultimate. But we haven't covered it. I haven't racked it into your brain yet. <laughs> Very good, my dear. Oh, thank you so much. Here you're Let's eat it. <laughs> What is the main topic of Sunday's teachings? Uh, the morning. The, the morning. Spirit. Excellent. Good. Hey, hey, hey. Stay right there. <laughs> Tell me about what was what was the purpose of Passover? Passover, what what God was looking for when he when he passed over. Aha! Uh -huh. Now, what? Tell me about the sacrifice. What was one requirement of the sacrifice that it had to have? It had to be something. Correct. Absolutely good. Now, wait. I got one more. Within the word wilderness is what? Why? And why does God send him to the wilderness? What's his purpose? Why? For. Remember why he sent you to the wilderness? For. To learn. Is it because you, you won't learn where you're at or because there's something special you have to learn there? Yeah. Yeah. Get your attention. Spell, spell, spell experiential. I have no clue. <laughs> yes. P -E -R. Good I job. <laughs> and since you got beat up the most, she sure did. <laughs> she did. I didn't think she was going to get it. <laughs> Let me tell you something. 
I, I believe with everything in my heart that these stars represent rewards waiting in heaven for you. And when you get there, and he shows you the board with all the stars and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Right. You know, they might be little, but they're not. They're huge. They're big. And we got crowns in our, in our crowns in our thing. Our jewels in our crown. Finally, let's turn to 2 Peter <laughs> to finalize this section of teaching. Now remember, we are not done with the experiential sanctification. Okay, okay? we couldn't finish today. Okay. And we've already gone through Psalm 27 and 28. But I want to okay. I want to complete all of this teaching okay. by the second Peter passages. Okay. And then we are finished for the night. Y'all have done so well. <laughs> Let me tell you something. That's the hardest thing you never do. The fact that you apply what you learn is the greatest reward for me. It's the best. It's what matters the most. Application. You can have all the head knowledge in the world, but have no application, and it's useless. You ever heard the passage, faith without works is dead? But they always teach, oh, that means you got to work for your salvation. That's nothing to do with it. It means biblical knowledge, mm -hmm. faith, pistis, means biblical knowledge, right. without application, is useless. That's true. You know, you know how I know that's what that means? Is it because I'm a genius? No. Romans. Because you study. Let's go to James before we go to Peter. Okay. James, James chapter 2. Is it in the Old Testament or New Testament? New. James. J, J, J. John. This is one of the most confused passages in the Bible. Because when you read it in face value, you're, you, 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 it, it, the, 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 um, the answer to the biggest question is the first question that it asks. And usually you just walk over it. You don't, you don't even question it. But when you answer the question, James, James, James yeah. I James Maybe I'm just making it up. It's a couple pages before Peter. Look. Hebrews, James. 336. 336. 336. Okay, here. I'm there. James chapter 4. Oh, we're on 4? I'm sorry, 2. Fourteen. James. Chapter 2, verse 14. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? Yeah. The first question he'd ask is, save him from what? True. If this faith has to do with eternal security, and eternal salvation, then the answer would be it would save him from the lake of fire. But that's not what it has to do with. It has to do with being saved from a young death. I'll explain why. It says, what use is it, my brother, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without faith, clothing and in need of daily food and one of you says to him go in peace be warmed and be filled and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body what use is that what does that have to do with faith nothing works something but check this action aha so now watch this 
What you go back to 14, what use is it, my brother, if a man says he has knowledge, biblical knowledge, because the word faith, besides meaning faith for salvation, also means faith for knowledge. It has more than one meaning. If it says he has biblical truth or knowledge, but he has no application. It says, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and you just say, go peace, I'll pray for you, but you don't give it to him, how is that applying? If you have it, you're applying it, so you give it to him. That's how we know that that's what it means. But look at this. Even if so, knowledge, if it has no application, is dead, being by itself. If this Bible just sits here and no one reads it, what good is it? It's when you read it and you apply it that it becomes effective. How many times have you heard me say, if I have a headache and I have an aspirin and I look at it, <laughs> and they I'm going to help. Till I take it, it's useless. Now watch this. If you change all the word faith and works to knowledge and application, look at verse 18. But someone may well say, if you have knowledge and I have application, show me your knowledge without the application, and I will show you my knowledge by my application. Oh. Imagine that. It's the same thing as saying put up or shut up. You know what I mean? You talk a good game, but you don't walk the walk. Walk the walk. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. People use that passage in saying that demons believe in Jesus. No, they know who Je he knows who Jesus is. Otherwise, why would he have tempted them? Yeah, they do use that verse. They do. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that knowledge without application is useless? Was not our father justified by application when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you remember Abraham and Isaac? Abraham was promised a child. Here is the child. Now he says, go up on the mountain and kill it. What? Just testing Knowledge without application is useless. So he said he knew, and the Bible says this, and I'll cover this some other time. The Bible does say this, that Abraham knew that God had the power to raise from the dead. So he knew even if he killed Isaac, he could raise him up from the dead, is what the Bible says. So when he went down, he, oh, wait! It was by his application, knowing who God is, that he was found righteous. But the question is, was what happened to Isaac, was that before or after he was saved? Which one saved? Uh, Abraham. Was it before or after? He was saved already because he believed. He looked forward to God. Come Not on. because he did this work was he saved. No. He was already believed mm -hmm. and was count, found, found for righteousness. Look. Right. You see, verse 22, that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was matured. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. But some say, well, I thought it was faith alone and Christ alone. It is. But there's two kinds of justification. Justification for salvation and justification for works. There's two different kinds. We can be it's called double justification. We haven't even gotten there yet. Right. Forgive me for even right. mentioning it and throwing you this double, triple ball. But the ah. point is, is that knowledge without application is useless. Let's go to 2 Peter. 
See, I started opening up a can and realized that worms were all over the we place. We can't open that can That's yet. That's all right. We will. Second Peter. Three. Three. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you. Which one? Second. Second. In which I am stirring up your sincere mind by the way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all continue just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water. You remember? Remember the frozen and defrosted? Uh, when you take a uh, ice holder, what do you fill it with? Water. And what does it do? Freeze. And when you put it in water, what happens? Through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape you notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance, to a change of mind. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you be in holy conduct? And what? Uh-huh. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace. What's next? Peace. Spotless and blameless. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> and regard the patience of our Lord to be salvation, just as also our beloved Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you is also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of scriptures to their own destructions. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, lest being carried away by the error of the unprincipled men, you fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for this teaching. Thank you for the wonderful two services and the great worship we had today. I just ask, Father, that you will watch over us and give us journey mercies as we make our way home. We know tomorrow is a brand new day. We look forward to Wednesday when we continue on your teaching of Genesis and we Continue on with the genealogies and all the other wonderful things that you have us learn about your word and your truth. We love you so much. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.